don't know any jokes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's one in every crowd. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay. This panel has been a tradi the traditional panel that has concluded the Cherry Blossom Festival for many years. Many of these faces have uh, been longtime participants in this panel. In fact, while we were at the Jubilee Theater for the play the other night, it made me think about this the first year of this panel and being there, and some of you may have had those memories as well. But there are some new faces on the panel this year as well. It's great to welcome Tweed Roosevelt to, to the panel this year um, and to see many returning guests that have become very special friends to us. And again, to have the honors to be our moderator, um, a man who's been so helpful at this Cherry Blossom Festival, my good friend, presidential historian, Larry Cook. Please put your hands together for him. Well, thank you all for being here. This is so exciting, and, and I said it the last time, I'm gonna say it again, I hit the history lottery, able to moderate this, this wonderful panel here. There's just so much history, and, uh, and all these people on this panel have become friends of mine, and it's just, uh, it's just really great, and I'm honored to, to be here. And so, we're gonna get started, uh, and what I'd like to do is just go down the line, if you each would just pick up the microphone and say who you are and who you're related to. Is it on? No. Yep, you're good. Is it on? Okay, I'm Tweed Roosevelt, and uh, Theodore Roosevelt was my great-grandfather. I'm Mary Jean Eisenhower, and Dwight Eisenhower was my grandfather. I'm Bert from Hayes Davis, and Jefferson Davis was my great-great-grandfather, and Rutherford B. Hayes was my great-great-great-cousin on the fifth time and I'm related to Zachary Taylor by death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Richard Gatchell, and uh, James Monroe is my fifth great-grandfather. I'm George Cleveland. I'm the grandson of Grover Cleveland. Ulysses Dietz. I'm the great-great, a great-great-grandson of Ulysses S. Grant. Massey McKinley. I'm the great-great-nephew of William McKinley. I'm Marie Clinton Bruno. I'm the non-descendant on the panel uh, because the descendant, Chelsea Clinton, is doing great and is a mother of three kids and running a foundation. My grandfather, Roy's younger brother, was Bill's stepfather, Roger Clinton. So I am technically his first cousin once removed. But in Arkansas, you're just cousins. <laughs> what a great panel, huh? Lots of history. Tweed, I, I'd like to start with you, and welcome for your first time here. Uh, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Teddy's famous trip out west and kind of what uh, led him to go out there, and then uh, a little bit about what he did while he was there. Okay. I planned to sit on this end because I thought you were going to sit on that <laughs> end and you wouldn't notice me. But. You can't hide, Tweed. You can't hide. Uh, let's see. Theodore Roosevelt uh, was newly married. His wife uh, and he had been about two years, I think, and she was getting ready to produce their first child, turned out to be a girl. He was a state legislature, which meant that he was up in Albany uh, and his family lived in New York City. And she did indeed give birth, and he received a telegram. He was, of course, delighted, but he thought he'd wait a little while to come down. Well, a little later that day, he got another telegram that wasn't quite as happy, it said he had to come home immediately. Things didn't look too good at home. And when he got back to his house in New York City, his uh, brother was waiting for him on the, what we call a stoop, the stairs in front of the house, and said, there's a, something like, there's a black cloud over this house. Your wife is dying, and so is our mother, who is living in the same house. And so T.R. went in, and uh, that very day, both his wife and his mother died on the same day in the same house. Needless to say, it was an enormous blow, and uh, he was completely knocked off his pins. Uh, some people were afraid he was going to kill himself, 
and uh, but he pulled himself together he went back to albany for a uh, to finish up the session and then he wanted to get away from it all and he thought the way to do it was to bury himself in north dakota where he had re recently bought a uh, uh, cattle ranch well really a sort of a, uh, they open ranged cattle and so he just had a kind of a homestead there and he moved out there and that's really where he recovered from this tragedy. He said at one point, black care seldom follows a man who rides fast enough. And so that's where he recovered. And uh, yeah, you did, did well. Could you just uh, talk just, uh, just briefly about a couple of the things that he did out there? I think he did a little bit of uh, law enforcement <laughs> unofficially maybe, but. Well, um, let's see. It's uh, 420. I got an hour for this, folks. So. <laughs> uh, he, he, he was a rancher, uh, and so he had sunk about a quarter of his not inconsiderable uh, inheritance into this ranch. And he became, he's the boss, the cowboys were working for him. And as an open range ranching, uh, they just let the cattle roam in what's called the Badlands out there. It's not very good country for anything other than cattle. And so they did all the things they do with that. But what it, how it affected him were really three ways. One, uh, he, this was, he, he was raised in a very effete, East Coast, upper class, snobbish uh, environment. And he went to Harvard, which was equally snobbish. So this was a major opportunity, or he saw it as a major opportunity, or a learning uh, opportunity, to see what real Americans were like. And it completely changed his view uh, about ordinary Americans very important thing for his future life. Uh, second important thing, sticking to the political, it made him no longer just an East Coaster, but he was a Westerner as well. And politically, that was a very advantageous to him. But perhaps the most important thing he learned out there, keep in mind, in 1900 or 1880s, the United States, people, the people in this country didn't understand anything about conservation. They believed, and I'll talk later tonight about this more, but they believed that our resources were endless. And uh, it was there that he learned that wasn't true. He saw what was happening to the animals, he saw what was happening to the environment, and that started the whole environmental thing. So those are three major things he learned there. Nice, thank you very much. Thank you. Marie. I, uh, hey. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> good. It's good to see you again. Good to see you too. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what the Clintons are doing now. Um, um, the president, I'm, well, Bill, I'll just say that, but he's gotten into podcasting. He's doing quite a bit. You can just pretty much Google President Clinton and podcasts and all the topics that he has been speaking with internationally and globally, or well, globally, internationally, same thing. But um, um, really enjoying those. Um, just I haven't seen him really in the last couple of months. We did a family Zoom call, and he was on, but I didn't recognize the background. He's been on a number of things, and you can see the background at the home in Chappaqua. And we were talking about where each of us were all around the country and what was going on. And uh, when COVID hit, um, Chelsea and Mark can pretty much work from anywhere, you know, via the internet, and they have three young children, the youngest I haven't met yet, the top two are adorable. Um, anyway, they decided with COVID and being in New York City to just let's go on and just move in with grandma and grandpa. So they all moved to Chappaqua and they're still there, I believe. But um, last fall, as it was getting to be Christmas and talking about they celebrate both the Jewish and the, and the Christian holiday, um, Charlotte, the eldest, got worried that Santa Claus didn't know that she had moved to grandma and grandpa's house and got a little little started getting a little upset about Santa not being able to find her so when he joined the family zoom call Christmas afternoon he was at their apartment they acquiesced and went down back down to New York City for Christmas Eve so Santa could could show right. up so um, he's really um, enjoying the the piece of COVID if you could that you have all your, your children your child and, and your son-in-law and the three children with you um, everybody's quite well so nice. So, when, um, I don't know if you're coming back to me or not, if I can give an update on the library. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of people to talk to, so. Yeah, well, 
Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. You've mentioned Just, a few um, about the library. Go ahead. Sure. The Clinton Library, we hope, please, I know many of you have come to see it, and please come back if you, if you can, and if you haven't, I encourage you to make a trip to Little Rock to see the library. Um, I got a little emotional this morning in Lewis's very wonderful presentation about your president, Ulysses, um, with Grant's tomb, because there's been an addition to the Clinton Library in the last couple of years, and that is um, President Clinton's tomb. If you go into the library now, if you look just right to the east side, um, right behind the library, we are, that, that's ready to go. And um, is Richard Lamont here? I'm, he's probably, know he's got a lot. Okay. He gave a very good speech a couple of years ago, and it put a lot of things in perspective because you think about this when you're a relative in a small family, as the Clintons are, that the inevitable will happen. How does this go and all? And um, you, pre you prepare for every president, even Mr. Biden, Mr. Trump, and all the others that are still alive. Um, you prepare right away. There's a lot of preparations going on for the planned eventual death and then the unplanned. So God forbid something happened, you know, to Mr. Biden today unplanned, there's already a motion set in place. For the planned, if there's, once you reach a certain age, um, you begin planning your planned death, <laughs> whether you like to or not, and that has become with, be, begun with him now that he's in his 70s. So um, it's a little emotional to see that, but, um, you know, Grant's tomb is now in a very cool place, and Taker has been well taken care of, and... Um, a lot of space, yeah. And this is right next to the library, so it, it, don't be surprised if you look out the back window and you see something there. But please come down and visit. They're hoping to reopen in July, and um, we'd love to have you there. So, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's good to hear good things, you know, and, and uh, about how the Clintons are doing, and, and uh, certainly appreciate all your work, too, with the, at the library and your participation there. Um, that was kind of a segue into Ulysses. Uh, I actually had a different question for you, but then during Lewis's, uh, Lewis's presentation today, I was so taken by your active participation and the, uh, in, in saving Grant's tomb, really. Uh, and so I decided to, to change it up a bit and ask you to elaborate on that a little bit more on, uh, on how you took on that cause and, and I would imagine the, the struggles that were involved with uh, getting that restored back to what it is today. Yeah, I, I'm only laughing because... Yes, I was told to turn it on and I forgot. <laughs> uh, but as, as Lewis rightly brought up is Frank Scaturo, who my cousin Claire and I kept referring to him as our son. Uh, <laughs> because he, he was such a kid when he started that, and now, now he's a middle-aged man and he's married and he's no fun anymore because, you know, <laughs> yes. but, but <laughs> right. And, uh, but the tomb was, uh, was my journey path. That sounds strange, but, but it was through the tomb that I woke up and realized that I needed to uh, know what was going on. But Frank Scaturo really did all the work. I was the shill. I was the public, I was the waving, smiling face. Because as Lewis said, Frank is very literal, very factual, very analytical. And he's very good in front of a camera, but he's very relentless in front of a camera. Whereas I smile and I'm charming and I can, I can babble because I'm a museum curator and that's my, that was my job, was to be good in front of a camera for short amounts of time. And so, so I became the sort of talking head when the press wanted to talk to someone named Ulysses. And, uh, and I'm the only, as I, as I said the other day, I'm the only one in my generation named Ulysses. And I'm actually the youngest one in my generation. And so my brother, who is just as much a descendant, is named John Dietz. So who cares? And my cousin Claire, who I adore, is just as much a descendant. And her name is Claire Teleski. So she's got a Hungarian last name. And so the press are going to avoid her if US Grant comes up. But I'm Ulysses, so people would talk to me. So, so that's sort of, I fell into that. Frank Scaturo talked me into that, talked me onto the board of the reestablished re Grant Monument Association. And, and I became the one that the press would call. When Beyonce, danced half naked in front of the tomb and scandalized the Wall Street Journal. I'm the one they called. And I didn't know who Beyonce was at that point, but <laughs> now my daughter's favorite singer. But so, so I became sort of that, that 
quasi-public face. But then, but it, but it also, it started really before Frank. It started in 1987 when I was invited by the Park Service to speak as happens every year on April 27th for, to his, for his birthday commemoration. And I was basically, the Park Service blundered around, and I don't want to criticize the Park Service in general, but this group really blundered and humiliated me publicly on live television. And I wrote them a really shirty letter and said, look, if you ever expect the Grant family to get involved with Grant's tomb, we're going to lay down a few rules. Like one, you don't surprise us on live television. And two, that you consult, that you pay attention to what the family thinks. And, and then I realized, well, the family actually probably doesn't care anymore because they've scattered. And so I'm here. I guess I better start. And, and that's really what happened. And then it was 10 years later, that, and that wonderful picture of me in that great suit, uh, I walked up Riverside Drive with Rudy Giuliani, who said hello and then ignored me uh, the whole time because he was campaigning. But I smiled and waved, and I thought, but, and there was a lot of my family was there. There were a couple dozen descendants of U.S. Grant there, all of whom were completely ignored by the press uh, because I was the one named Ulysses. So that sort of became the role that I decided I better take on. And then my mother, Julia, said, you need to go on the board of the U.S. Grant Association, which is now the managing organization for the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library, which, has anyone been to it? Well, you've been to it. <laughs> You're my shill. <laughs> but it's in Starkville, Mississippi, at Mississippi State University, which is a long story, but it's there. The museum is wonderful. So it's a real presidential library with a museum, and uh, I'm on that board. And so I, little by little, I, it's not just that I did things, but I realized I had to stop being ignorant. I started reading people's books. And I'm not a history reader. I'm a romance novel reader. I'm, I'm a fiction reader. I read books about silver and old houses. And, so, and, and now I read books. The latest book I read, I'm in the middle of another one, which is a manuscript, but the latest book I read was yours. And uh, for, for, what's the expression? Forewarned is forearmed. That's not quite the right, but yeah, that's not the right good. term then. Uh, the more I know, the less ignorant I feel. I used to go to these meetings with Civil War buffs and Grant buffs and think, oh my God, I'm a moron, I know nothing. They ask me questions and I just <laughs> gape at them. But now I can actually answer the questions. And I've, I've, I, I know Ron Chernow, I've read his book, I've emailed him about his book, I've commented about his book. And, that go, and the more I do that, the more I feel that I'm kind of honoring these people whose legacy I'm apparently protecting <laughs> but never knew it until I stumbled into it. And uh, now the hard task ahead of me is getting the rest of the family to pay attention to. Sure. Thank you. Mary, you uh, were christened in the White House. I know you've told me some great stories over the past few years of, of your time with your grandfather in the White House. You were fortunate to, to be able to know your grandfather where some of the other Panelists here never actually, you know, knew their their uh, their ancestor. But um, I'd like you to share uh, a favorite story from the White House time. Well, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like what was said earlier. Do you have? Uh, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, do you have two days? <laughs> yeah. Um, but one one thing that um, was kind of interesting. We had a home in uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and Granddad had his farm, and the two properties abutted. But life was centered around the White House, and so uh, Christmas time was always a dilemma because it, it was never a hard thing to figure out what to get each other, except Granddad, who had everything. You know, what do you get the President of the United States for Christmas? So I had a very smart mother who um, uh, decided we were going to put on a Christmas pageant for him. Um, now, the, the, the second floor of the White House, which is the residential floor, um, has on the east side and the west side recessed windows. And so they, they were serving as the stage. And my mother took um, sheets and cut necks out for them and then put garland around the necks and cardboard wings on the back, right? Four of them. There were four of us, my brother and two sisters and me. And um, then she took um, uh, twinkling lights 
and uh, a coat hanger and made halos out of um, the lights and the, and the garland and the uh, halo and ran the, the sleeve down or the wire down our sleeves and uh, put um, uh, D batteries in our hands um, <laughs> disguised to look like candles and if you press the bottom of the battery the, the lights would twinkle, right? <laughs> and um, so she was actually quite smart. Um, so we turned out all the lights on the second floor and there's an oversized corridor that goes between the two wings and uh, we proceeded, you know, of course choreographed by my mother, um, to sing Silent Night and all these different very gentle, while we were sparkling down the hallway, I'm sure as much like an angel as we would ever be, um, and to the other side where my grandparents were. And, um, he loved it so much that he gave each of us a dollar because he said it was cheaper than the theater. <laughs> <laughs> your, your mother sounded like she was like an electrical engineer almost to be able to figure that out. That yeah, yeah. That, some, of the, some of the subsequent <laughs> birthday parties were like that too because uh, we would put on plays and she would do the casting and the makeup and all that stuff. You know, we did the sound of music. I was Gretel. Uh, <laughs> you know, things, you know, she, she was just very clever. Very nice. Very nice, thank you. Massey, I, uh, now William McKinley was the last Civil War veteran to become president. And uh, I don't think people, a lot of people realize that he did have a role in the Civil War. And uh, if you could talk about sure. that, I'd appreciate that. So McKinley and Rutherford B. Hayes had quite the parallelism, they were both sons of Ohio, they both were very religious men, and they both had a passion for being abolitionist. And I think, primarily from my readings, that I, I, I think that McKinley never would have become president had it not been for the, the guidance, the mentorship of Rutherford B. Hayes, because McKinley, as a young man, entered the Civil War as a private. Uh, he worked his way up and, and, and slowly but surely became a, a, a major, and I think that's basically because of the, the hands of Rutherford B. Hayes. But he served as a quartermaster during the entire period of the war, and they maintained that friendship for many, many, many years. In fact, I talked to uh, Rutherford's descendants, Burke and Teddy Hayes, who sit on our board of directors for the society, and also Jay Garfield, uh, the, the, the third great-grandson of, of James Garfield. And between the three, they would often take the train to either mentor, you know, Ohio, or they would come to uh, Canton, Ohio, and they would reminisce about the Civil War. So, you know, the, the, the three families, the, the Hayes family, the McKinley family, and the Garfield family certainly, you know, had a special bond and they had that special bond because of, of the Civil War. So McKinley certainly, you know, he wasn't a general uh, like uh, Garfield and, and Hayes was, but he certainly had a passion for, you know, duty to country, and he had that, that, that desire to, to serve because he believed that slavery was wrong and he wanted to give back to his country. Sure, and I, I believe, and. I'm not, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but I wanted to ask you, uh, did he serve as a commissary of subsistence? Uh, that's that's was correct. His main, yes. main function in there, that's right. which uh, if, if people don't know what that is, that, that's really somebody that's responsible for getting the supplies there. That's right. Uh, which is a very, very important job. And um, so I, I believe that. And I, as a historian, I just love the fact that, you know, he served with, with Hayes yeah. And, and, you know, you just picture this, this Civil War camp with a campfire going and they're sitting around it and, you know, did either one of them ever think that they would become president of the United States or, or think that the other one may become president of the United States someday? Probably, probably not, but, right. you know, but as a historian, your mind kind of works that way, but you can Absolutely. just kind of envision that and I think that's very cool and I, and I appreciate you bringing in the Garfield uh, yeah. connection as well. So that was, that was really nice. Uh, while we're on the on the Civil War, uh, Bertram will will go to you, and uh, you know I just want to say I really enjoyed yours and Ulysses' 
presentation yesterday. As a historian, it just gives you goosebumps to, to see you two on the stage. And, and uh, I think if your uh, ancestors were looking down on you uh, both, I think they would be smiling. Uh, I, I really believe that. And um, I, I know there was much more that you would like to have said about your great-great-grandfather yesterday. And what, what is the main thing that you would really like people to know about Jefferson Davis that they, they probably don't know? First, I want to thank Ulysses. You know, uh, we, we met, I don't know, eight years ago or ten years ago in Natchez, Mississippi. Didn't know who each other was. But what we've grown is, is that we have attacked our history the same way. He was a little bit older than I was when he didn't know anything about Grant. I was about 28. But we took the initiative to learn from a period of we have the name and what are we going to do with it because I'm the only lineage of the descendants of Jefferson Davis who has both the name Hayes and Davis. There's a hundred descendants of Jefferson Davis of which most of them have no interest or nor care or maybe a certain amount of fear about being related to Jefferson Davis. And so as I carry that, I, I've realized that early on I better know what I'm doing before I even portray the fact that I'm a, a, a descendant and how do we do that correctly. We learn, as, as Ulysses said, we learn. And, and I've read everything about Davis, but I've done something else for 40 years. I've traveled everywhere that Davis was. I stood in places from birth to death and marriage and children and, and college and all of these things. And, and as I go through my life, I get the opportunity to, to lecture about him about 20 weeks a year on riverboats. And what I start with is that one sentence I said today is, you all know as President of the Confederate States of America, and that raises the question as you look at me, what are you doing here? <laughs> well, what we found is that we have a common goal to preserve our history. We don't really have any political agenda or anything else. We're here as preservationists. And as a preservation of Jefferson Davis, you talk about that moment, and it defines him. But it's 52 years of his life that was not known, or the last 30 that's not known. And what I want people to believe is that even though he chose what he did based on a selection of a group of people in Montgomery, Alabama, who picked him, he was a man at 52 years old that was an American for 52 years. And as we look at this panel, we have three descendants of presidents that went to West Point. Can you raise your hands? <laughs> and people are amazed. They go, wait, wait, what are you raising your hand for? That, that's not possible. But as I tell people, that's just the beginning of this marvelous story about all the things that Davis does. He's in the Army. He's a United States representative. He goes to the War of 1847. What the main cog of Davis is, though, he is in Washington, D.C. from 1847 to 1860, and he becomes one of the most powerful people in Washington, D.C. As Secretary of War, the icon that I spoke about this, this morning was the, or yesterday, was the Capitol. And people realize that maybe I speak about Jefferson Davis not to say that he was not a slaveholder or he didn't believe in slavery or he didn't leave the South. None of those things can I deny. But I also want to put it in context of the entire picture of the individual. And I preach the term of respect saying, take another look. Because after you take another look at every individual that you have an interest in in a history book, be it Dwight Eisenhower, Ulysses Grant, Truman, Roosevelt, whoever it is, if you take that moment and, and look at them from a different perspective, you'll hear something or see something that you didn't know. That's my role. I'm kind of the Ulysses S. Grant of the Jefferson Davis where I present myself as the person who is historically entrenched in preserving my great-great-grandfather's history and telling the entire story. Well said. And you know, yesterday when you had mentioned about the Capitol, uh, I didn't know that as a historian. Uh, I'm not ashamed to admit it, I didn't know that. And I was grateful for you, to, you know, telling that. And uh, those are the stories that need to be told. And I appreciate it, thank you. George, I had 
talked to Tweed in the beginning here about Teddy making the trip out west. And as a young man, your grandfather made a trip to Buffalo and it changed history. And I know you're very, uh, uh, very entrenched into the history of Buffalo and, and go there often. Could you tell us why Grover as a young man went to Buffalo in the first place? And then just give us a little rundown, uh, if, <laughs> a little rundown, he did a remarkable amount of things in Buffalo, but just kind of give us a rundown of what he did do uh, while he was there in Buffalo. <clears throat> sure. Let me, let, me just, let me just first say how really, really nice it is to be here with you guys this year. There was such a hole in 2020 yes. by not being able to come to the Cherry Blossom Festival. And this is, you know, in many ways making up for that only double. And I really appreciate, and I know all of us do, you know, the extra effort everybody's gone to to make things happen this year. So thank you. It's really, really nice to, to be here. Um, Grover was headed to um, headed west because go west, young man. Um, the family, his uh, his family, his 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 father, who was a Presbyterian minister, had been assigned to a church in Fayetteville, New York, and um, he wasn't. He was looking for something to do. He needed to make money. He had all this family, and they were, you know, kind of on his case. So. We had relatives in, surprise, Cleveland, Ohio. And he was, uh, because relatives of mine, the cleverly named brothers Moses and Aaron, um, had gone out there and, and lived. And they said, come on out and uh, work with us. Grover got as far as Grand Island um, in, in Buffalo. And his uncle, Lewis Allen, said, no, stay here, work for me and uh, on the farm, and that is what he started to do. He became interested in law, he started studying. Uh, you didn't, there wasn't really that formal a law school. What you did was you clerked for an attorney, and that started his political career, and um, you know, he was elected sheriff, and, and you all know the story. He's the only president of the United States that ever executed two people by hanging, and um, which he did because Usually in Erie County, New York, the deputy was the one that pulled the, the lever, but Grover felt that subordinates shouldn't do the dirty work, so he, as distasteful as he found it, went and pulled the lever, the lever himself. And um, a lot of rapid growth in the politics. Po Buffalo was a wide open town then, the western terminus of the Erie Canal. You know, at one point, I think it's when he was mayor, he got in a huge fist fight that went outside of a bar and into the street and, you know, off of hay bales, bales and rum barrels, which is where you used to campaign from. Um, so eventually, and then bang, 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 mayor, governor, president. Um, it just, it sort of happened a very, you know, not, not a completely dissimilar uh, trajectory as what Bill Clinton did, where it just bang, 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 suddenly um, a whole bunch of offices all at once. And Buffalo um, was at one point one of the, the largest ports in the United States um, and uh, being right on the Great Lakes and as I said on the western terminus of the canal, they still have all the great grain elevators that you can go kayaking by. They call it the concrete Atlantis. These great huge crumbling things that really look like you're on an, an alien world. And uh, it's such a wonderful melting pot city. A Grover Cleveland High School it's now known as iPrep at Grover. Forty languages can be heard in the halls of that school. Four zero forty, um, and I've worked with them on various history projects and uh, with National History Day, both in Western New York and New York, and it's it's wonderful. And I should also say that um, about to reopen is the all new Buffalo Presidential Center that a group of people have put together there, which is. Um, which is kind of, it's an ode to the two presidents from Buffalo, Millard Fillmore and Grover Cleveland, then as well as a lot of the, not just also Rands, but we're also in there, Bill Miller, who was, whose vice president was Bill Miller? Barry Goldwater. Um, right, Goldwater Miller, AUH2O. Um, and uh, Shirley Chisholm, Shirley Chisholm, Belva Lockwood, uh, the, the political history is rich there, so that's gonna be opening and, um, and Larry, I think you're addressing them sometime in the not too far distant future, the Buffalo Presidential Center. Yes, we're setting that up now, yeah. So it's Absolutely. still a perky city, food is still good. I have not been there in a year or more. Um, started several big projects that I'd been working on. Um, got two and a half hours of a documentary filmed and then had to stop that. 
and started, you know, work on my Dream Grover Cleveland Foundation, and then, you know, we had to pull back on that, but sure. I'm ready to re-accelerate, or as we used to say in Baltimore, re-exhilarate um, at any time. So, it's bubbling. Uh, before you click that off, I did want to ask you about the Antique Roadshow story. Oh, right. <laughs> Programming note. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're a fan of Antique Roadshow, I'm not sure which day it is, check your local listings, but in May, Mo Rocca is going to be on Antiques Roadshow during a celebrity uh, Antiques Roadshow event. And he is going to be on there with his phony bust of Grover Cleveland. And when Mo Rocca was here a few years ago, he's a, Mo is, as you know, is a big history presidential fan, and he had on his phone these this pictures of this bust he had bought someplace on Long Island. And he kind of sidled up to me and he goes, is it or isn't it? I said, it isn't. I mean, it's sort of the guy looks like the president of the 1904 president of a proctology college. He kind of has that, <laughs> that kind of, of countenance. So, but the, the thing is they're gonna be using footage from when Mo was here um, in Marshfield and, um, and he's, gonna be, he's gonna be talking a little bit about Marshfield. So, so check that and it, and it should be pretty funny and to see you know, Mo get his bust shut down. So. Um, so again, it's coming up at some point in May. I don't know exactly when. Great, thanks, George. I just wanted to include a, a little thing uh, in there that's that's very uh, special to me is that I grew up in Manlius, New York, which is about 10 miles outside of Syracuse, New York. And uh, Fayetteville is right next door. I went to Fayetteville Manlius High School, to give you an idea. So I've always known as a little as a little presidential history geek, I always was like thrilled that Grover Cleveland spent uh, some years of his childhood there in Fayetteville, New York, and I always wondered if I was walking in the same footsteps of Grover Cleveland, you know, when I lived in Manlius all my life. And um, so we're, we're working on getting George to, to Fayetteville, uh, New York, and, and would be thrilled to, to make that happen. But uh, in addition to that, and talking with Ulysses when he came, we, we, Ulysses and I met uh, just briefly on Zoom before, but in talking to Ulysses, Ulysses is from Syracuse. And uh, he has relatives in Fayetteville, New York, and then in Casanova, New York, which is just on the other side of Manlius. So it was just kind of neat how all that, all that tied in with, uh, with Fayetteville, New York. And so uh, it, was, it was really neat to, talked to you yesterday about that Ulysses and, and, and again today so uh, Richard don't don't mean to make you last but I, I uh, worked my way toward the middle there I wanted to uh, just tell you how much I enjoyed your program yesterday and and all the all the knowledge that you have uh, about James Monroe and you know you don't hear a whole lot about James Monroe and uh, it was great to to hear your presentation yesterday um, I wanted to ask you, uh, I'm into the relationships of the presidents and if they got along and if they didn't and, and that with each other. I'd like to ask you a little bit about uh, Monroe's relationship with Thomas Jefferson, both politically and personally. Sure, thank you. And uh, I, I want to just go back to something George mentioned to me. It was a, a sort of a joke, an inside joke about Baltimore. George went to Roland Park Country School in the last year that it was co-ed and, and graduated fifth grade. Third grade, okay. But he graduated third grade, way to go. And uh, so we had this little Baltimore running joke that uh, my daughter, uh, wife, mother-in-law, and grandmother all went there. So, uh, and they live right down the street from, uh, from Ulysses' brother. So uh, good to put Baltimore on the map. Um, but uh, th thank you for asking about Monroe and Jefferson. And uh, I've just became aware of a story uh, between the two uh, that I'll get to at the end. But I, I, I wanna kinda give you a background of Thomas Jefferson uh, was 13 years older than James Monroe, and their, their relationship started to blossom uh, late during the Revolutionary War. I'm gonna say in about the 1778, 79, 80 time frame, when Jefferson had asked Monroe to be, uh, to, to, to be sort of run a spy ring to find out where Cornwallis was, where, where his movements were in the Carolinas and throughout Virginia. And so Monroe was a writer and he, d he developed a spy ring. So Jefferson, who was the governor of Virginia at the time, knew exactly where they were. So if they need to evacuate the capital within a day or two, they knew what was going on. So they developed a professional relationship then. And then throughout that, after the war, in about the mid-1780s, 
they lived together in Annapolis, and they were roommates as, as they were starting to, to form the government uh, and, and, and having their time in Annapolis. In fact, Jefferson had a, uh, a chef from France, and Monroe learned to speak French from him, and he would later be assigned as the minister to France, but that's where he started to, to, uh, to learn uh, French. And then even into the 1790s, uh, when Jefferson was overseas, Monroe would write him letters about what was going on in the States. Very, the, so they were very close, and in his presidency, Jefferson asked Monroe to go help negotiate the Louisiana Purchase. It was actually the Purchase of New Orleans at the time. It turned into be the Louisiana Purchase. He sent three men as an envoy over, Monroe being one of those. So there was this, this professional trust. And then as they had uh, their houses at Monticello and Ashlawn, they were about three or four miles apart as the crow flies, uh, but about a 30 minute ride because it's very hilly. And they had a lighting system of lanterns that they would uh, put up in the tops of their houses, sort of, and I, I forget what the system was of, you know, one light means this, two lights means I'm coming over to your place for a drink, you're coming to my place to talk yeah. about history. But they had uh, a great friendship and relationship in that sense. And, and really, uh, you know, enjoyed each other's uh, company. And, even late into the, you know, the late 18 teens and early 1820s as, as Jefferson was starting uh, UVA and, and that, that was his brainchild and he needed some land. Monroe dedicated and donated some land. So, so some of the campus uh, of UVA is, is land given by Monroe. Just an incredible respect I I for each other. And there's Monroe Hall there too, if anybody's ever been on campus. It's a significant building there. And, and then I got to this uh, letter in this chapter in, in a book I just finished by Lynn Cheney that has kind of disturbed me, and, uh, and it's affected me. It's because it's, it's I've been reading about these guys' relationships forever. In 1823, Jefferson knew that uh, the postmaster general position of in Richmond was going to come up at some point in the next six or eight months. The guy there was getting ready to retire, a little older, and, and Jefferson had some people that worked for him in a legal sense and did some work around the property and, and it was a family that had three or four brothers and one of the brothers was kind of down on his luck and never had any money and this, that and the other and, and Jefferson thought he could kind of do this guy a solid and say, hey James, could you do me a favor? When that position comes up, I'd really love to see you to go to this guy. I forget his name, it's in my notes from before. And, and he wrote him a letter six months before saying, if, if and when this comes up, I'd love it to be Provost, I think, might have been his name. I could be wrong on that, but I'll call it that for the sake of this story. And, uh, and, and Monroe got that, and he felt uneasy about it because he didn't want to do a favor in that sense. In the letter, I've read the letter. It's unbelievable, saying, I will never, ever ask a favor again. I feel awkward doing this, but it's in the best interest of me and my friendships and this family that I feel that this guy should have this job. Well, then when the Postmaster General of Richmond came up, Monroe appointed a different man, a guy that had been the governor of Virginia multiple times and a guy that had been injured in the War of 1812 and was badly wounded and had recovered at Monroe's house. They were very close, and he was much more qualified than the family friend of Jefferson's. And he and Monroe appointed his guy and got a scathing letter from Jefferson saying, I thought you had my back. I'd already sort of given the guy the wink, wink that he was going to get the job. You didn't give him the job, and you made me look bad. And then Monroe wrote back, I'm the president of this country. I know that, that, that our relationship, but I'm not appointing someone because you think they should be. It's on my account. It's, it's my call, and this guy's better qualified. I'm sorry. And they went back and forth, and they never really resolved the problem. And later in their life, this is 1823, and then even in 1825, a year before Jefferson dies, they had a state dinner in Charlottesville. It was the 50th anniversary of Lafayette's visit. And he had about a six or eight month tour all throughout the US. It was a dinner there with Lafayette and Madison and Jefferson and Monroe was 30 minutes away and he did not attend just because he was so still so upset about this rift from a year and a half or two years earlier. And it wasn't until later on, even in, in late 1825, early 1826, that that, that uh, Monroe and Madison and Jefferson had a dinner and they kind of sorted through it, but they were still, they both dug their heels in so far. And as you know, the farther you dig your heels in, the, the, far the, the harder it is to let go. And, uh, and then it just pains me to know that their 45 plus year relationship ended on a note that was not good. And, and reading about that was, was upsetting to me, but you know, hi history's not here to be convenient and kind and happy all the time. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's unscripted and unplanned, and, well and that, that's how it happened, and that's how it ended. And, uh, and then Jefferson, I think a lot of people know Jefferson died on 
July 4th, 1826, and then Monroe died five years later on July 4th, 1831. And, and I'm kind of sad to know that, 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 that their relationship ended on a down note. Uh, I don't mean to bring the, the last speaker down on, the, you know, on, on this kind of thing, but it, it's, it's the all. truth. It's, it's the it's honesty of, of the times. So <laughs> go forth and prosper and have a great night. On that note. <laughs> I know many stories with today's or the one 20 years ago where that's, it's, it's unfortunate that happens, that happens a lot. Exactly. You don't get what you want because it is, in, it is their appointee. So. Exactly. And, and your, your comments on history there, Richard, thank you for that. Uh, you know, it was w very well said. I, uh, I would like to ask you, Massey, and then we're going to do one more uh, quick thing, and then I wanted to get a couple minutes to open it up to, to questions because we seem to always run uh, short on that time, and I wanted to get a couple questions from the audience. But, Massey, I would like you to, to talk about the uh, Presidential Descendant Society a little bit, make people aware of that. Because uh, I think, again, I think it's a great thing that, that you're, you all are doing, and, and uh, I think everybody should know about it. Absolutely. Uh, we're, I'm privileged to have, you know, most of these up on the stage as board of trustees of the society. But um, we, we, we founded the society for two reasons. Uh, one, for the camaraderie of knowing each other and getting a chance to actually spend time and learn about each other's families and about each other's, you know, ancestor. But secondly, we wanted to do, you know, good, common good for, you know, everybody. And I think the, 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 the pinnacle thing that we came up with is making sure that we had an opportunity to have an educational initiative. And that is to, number one, have a book prize that's biannual that actually awards a book that talks about first, the first book prize will be for presidential leadership and how important that is to our country. And then secondly, we wanted to make sure that we had, you know, a school-based curriculum based upon civics education and how important it is to vote and how important it is to be involved and, and you know, read about our, our leaders and understand why it's so important each and every election to vote. So between those initiatives and some of the, the different things that we'll be doing, some of that being college scholarship for students who want to, you know, study history and presidential leadership, that's the major reason why we came up with the idea of, of the society. And we hope that, uh, that you'll join us as ambassadors uh, in that quest. Uh, Tweed Roosevelt is our president. Uh, Linda Johnson Robb is one of the vice presidents. Uh, Clifton Truman Daniel is also a vice president. I'm, I'm the bottle washer and, uh, and kitchen cook on that end. And then we have all these wonderful people up here that are a part of the Board of Trustees. But I encourage you to go to our website, look at what we do. It's, it's uh, www.societyofpresidentialdescendants.org. Thank you. And uh, again, very important. And uh, it's, everybody needs to know about it. I'd like to do uh, one more quick uh, thing, and then we'll open it up to a couple of questions. I'm trying to stay on time here because of the uh, state dinner tonight, uh, but I just would like to quickly go down the, down the line here, and uh, I would like each one of you just to make a, a, a little concise statement about your, your relative, uh, just, just something nice, uplifting. I like to leave this on an uplifting note, and uh, just whatever comes to your mind. We'll start with you, Tweed. Okay, I'm not sure this is uplifting, but uh, in any case, T.R. is a very hard act to follow. He was an extraordinary man with some extraordinary individual characteristics uh, of, you know, capabilities. Just for example, when he led the Rough Riders, there were 1,100 men, and uh, they were together for about three months or so. And at the end, when they mustered out, TR lined up all the ones that survived, which were maybe 900 of them. And not only did he know every man's name, but he knew an anecdote. He shook every man's hand as they left, called him by name, and had a little sort of remembrance between the two of them. Uh, you know, if you have an ancestor like that, it is totally deflating. <laughs> uh, and uh, so for a long time, it's like some of the stories that were told here before, 
I didn't, you know, I didn't want to have anything to do with, with it all. You can imagine as a 20-year-old, the last thing you want is everybody to only be interested in your ancestor, not you. It was, it was kind of tough. Uh, but then I got into this business, but just like some of my colleagues up here, uh, I didn't know much about TR, and I started giving talks occasionally, and then people Q&As, and I got, would get into trouble occasionally, because somebody, I might say something that wasn't accurate, or, you know, so, and somebody in the audience would take me to task for it, and if I really got into trouble, I finally figured out the way out of getting out of that. I'd say, well, you may think that, but we in the family know better. <laughs> Well, my, my grandfather um, had a, a tremendous belief in the resilience of the everyday uh, person, including uh, our, uh, the, the grandchildren. I mean, he, he believed if given the reins, the people could find a way to live in peace, that they could find a way to make their way in this world. And he really believed in hands-off, shall we say, management, all the way to the point where one time he was uh, teaching me how to ride a horse and I was so little, they had to double the stirrups. And I might add, this was English style, not Western, so there was nothing to hang on to. So he started instructing me on, um, you know, you, you put the rein here and you, you pull to the right if you wanted to go right, you pull to the left, don't let him think you're afraid. Um, you know, and he, he said, grip with your knees, turn your toes in. He said, do you understand all that? And I said, yes, and he said, repeat it back. So I did, and he said, good. Good luck. He whacked the horse on the back end, and the horse took off. And my fanny and the saddle were like this, and I landed on the horse's neck, but I did not hit the ground. Great. And he was laughing. <laughs> Bertram? You know, I, I, I know that you all look at Jefferson Davis in, in a different light than the rest of these individuals up here, but I hope that you look at us all as the same as we go through this historic preservation and one thing I wanted to leave with you is that, that Davis was the president, and he, he, he did all that he could for what the cause was that he was elected to do. But in the 1880s, Davis was one of these resilient people that understood the, the focus of the country was not <coughs> behind them, but in front of them. And as he spoke in the 1880s, along his journey, he said, let us not hold what we saw before us as what it is. Let's unite in one country and go forward. And that statement in 1886 really didn't sit well with the South because they were still reeling. But his initiative to change the way people thought was a reconciliation moment that would carry on even as we today talk about history. And so I think I want you to look at him as that person that it was his way or the highway until he realized that the highway changed course and he needed to get on the right side. So he did do that later on in his life, and I perpetuate his history. So thank you again. Richard? Sure. Okay. Are we on? Yes, yes. Um, so for Monroe, I, th I think uh, if he was alive today, sort of what would he look back on and anything that in his time would he be proud of? And what people may not know is that in, the, in 1823, each year, presidents put in their articles into Congress, and his seventh articles to Congress in, in 1823 had a bunch of stuff in them. Embedded in there were some articles that were written, actually, by John Adams, John Quincy Adams, his Secretary of State, and co-written by him, that later became known as the Monroe Doctrine. He had no idea that he didn't put it in as the Monroe Doctrine in 1823. It wasn't until about 1850 that that subsection of, that, of those articles to Congress became known as the Monroe Doctrine. And it really, to that, to, from that time on and for a long time, really had a lot of teeth in it, basically saying the Western Hemisphere is not the fishing ground and the territorial takeover ground of Europe and of, uh, of, of any other countries, that they should all be uh, you know, sovereign and free. And, and that doctrine, that, that document has come into play a number of times since then, and I think it's still referenced today as, as people are trying to uh, take over different parts of, of possibly of South America. So I think he'd be proud that, that it, the, the document evolved into something with his name, and it still is topical today, 200 years later. Thank you. George? 
Um, I think you, several people have mentioned that um, I, Ulysses, I think you, Ulysses, I believe you had said about how you sometimes would, for a long time, just felt like a moron about anything information um, to do to do with your president. I've you know have certainly felt the same way. I've every Cherry Blossom Festival and so many other events. I learned something I never knew before. I never knew that Grover was the mourner in chief um, at at President Grant's funeral. I mean, that's that's you know I'd love to see that on a on a business card. Grover shows up a lot of times. It's kind of like the Where's Waldo um, because he had so many different positions that you guys. Oh, there he is crossing the Brooklyn Bridge at the opening of the bridge, and there he is doing that. Um, and there he is, and you know, and I think about him a lot, but having, having spent a lot of time this weekend talking about President Carter and, and just how much he loved to, to hunt and fish. And um, it's so exciting because people offer me tidbits of information here that I've never heard of before. And I kind of look at him and say, am I making that up? And then, you know, it turns out, no, that this person is a wealth of information. So deep mining again this year at the, um, the Cherry Blossom Festival, so. Thank you, George. Ulysses? Well, some of you may have seen the uh, History Channel special that came out of Ron Chernow's book, uh, but came out of a certain part of Ron Chernow's book. So since Steven Spielberg and Leo DiCaprio bought the rights to that book, and that's what came out of it, I watched it, I appreciated it, but I'm still waiting for the big romantic movie about Ulysses and Julia as the great love story of 19th century America from the frontier to Fifth Avenue, which is something I have spoken about. I can give lectures about their decorative arts and Julia's jewelry and the way they, de the way they decorate, I can give a whole lecture about the way all the first ladies decorated the White House. And, uh, but I haven't, I, I'm, history includes love, one hopes, and I wanna see them on screen. I wanna see who they cast as Julia frankly. <laughs> I don't know. I can't think of anybody young enough anymore because they were, they, were, they were still in there. She was like 42 and he was 46 when they went into the White House. So uh, who? Julia Roberts. Julia Roberts is Julia. Hey. How about Ulysses? Who's going to be Ulysses? Let's get well, this. <laughs> okay, let's not bog this down. In the, but we'll talk about this later. But that's what I'm waiting for. So that would be a fulfillment of my dream to see Hollywood really produce a romance about somebody that Hollywood thinks of as totally unromantic. So there we are. Great. Thank you, Massey. That's all a man can hope for during his lifetime, to set an example, and when he is dead, to be an inspiration for history. William McKinley. Wow. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Marie. Maybe it's a little fitting from what I just heard to what I was going to say in that uh, my cousin could have been an international tax lawyer, made millions of dollars, run a think tank, done a lot of private sector stuff, and his father-in-law, he wrought him, asked me one day years ago, why in the hell is he doing this political stuff? Do you, tell, you tell me. And I was probably in my early 20s, I guess. And um, I, I told him um, because he doesn't care about that stuff. He wants to make the world a better place. And therefore, after being educated at Yale, uh, undergrad, law degree, Oxford University, he decided to move back to Arkansas because he wanted to start in one of the poorest, unserved, underserved states in the country and try to make things better, beginning with um, he ran for third district Congress. He didn't make it, but he learned a lot. He became attorney general. He became governor for as long as he could be. And then a two-term president, and he included me and my, my cousins. We have been part of that every step of the way because he loves us and wants us to be aware of how important history is. Whether you like it or not, you are, as a family member, part of it, even though I'm not an official descendant. I'm working to get into the presidential society. <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll be your secretary for nothing. But um, anyway, he could have done anything he He does not care. It may, no matter what you think in the news, and please, please do not believe everything you hear on TV. Okay? And um, well, he is one of the kindest, most heartfelt, wonderful, wonderful people I've ever known. And I'm very grateful, and I think I can say the same for our state and our country for his service. Well said. Thank you. I'd like to take uh, just a couple of minutes for, for questions, and then I'll have a, a final statement. And, and uh, 
then we can get ready for the state dinner. So uh, I think Richard's going to play Phil Donahue here. Thanks. We have a dual act. Richard, get up. I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually have two questions. Um, first of all, out of all of you on the stage, how many of you have adult children? Define adult. Uh, well, you know, children, maybe they're young, but I figured they might be older. Uh, I'm just guessing. Anyway, my, um, my point is, is that, first of all, thank you for preserving history and everything that you do. And do your family members, uh, do your family, er, your, your adult children, do they show the interest of the history of, of your family in, in the presidential area? And do you see that continuing so that they are here 20 years from now or 50 years from now? Is that directed to anyone? Uh, anyone that wants to yeah. answer that? I, I, just, I just found it interesting because, again, I think it's important that we pass everything on to our children, right? And in this generation, are they showing that interest? You know, and if they're not, how do you keep them interested? You're, you're making a good point. Uh, I have two children, a boy and a girl. Uh, one of the problems is, you know, like genealogy in general, it's something that often comes later. And remember, kids, kids my kids' age, which are in their 30s, they're just trying to make their way in the world. We have our first grandchild. You know, life is very full. But the way I look at the two of them, I don't think my daughter, and who knows, who knows what the future has, but I don't think my daughter's ever going to be particularly interested. And now she has a different last name, of course. Uh, but I think my son may, but he doesn't have time for it now. Uh, but I hope he will. May I add to and that? Or is, may, just a quick Marie, add. Sure. Um, yes. Mine will be my 30-year-old. Um, hello. Oh, OK. Mine will be, I think, these, are, these folks here have been excellent examples of why they are still able to provide such an enriching background and history on their ancestors because mine's been alive for all of y'all and y'all know who he is so but I have saved and collected and given some things I think George or someone said you don't donate to the library you give them an acquisition they get it but you have to sign off on it so it's us, up to us and any of you that may be in this boat down the road no matter what office or what you do hang on to that stuff talk about that stuff because I agree with Tweed as they get older they're gonna go oh yeah I have I have that that's the, and it will become more important as they get older so yes but it's up to us to make that happen Richard, you wanted to say something? Real, real briefly, yes. My, my 20 year old daughter, Emery, is at Rhodes College in Memphis, and she just declared that she wanted to be a history major, 20 years old. And I asked her why of the baseline, and she goes, Going to Marshfield has been so special to meet all the other historians. It's made a big influence in her life. So it's a collective uh, thing from everyone in this room. Great, thank you. Uh, take another question. Because I know y'all miss me. We um, do miss you, Jill. <laughs> Jill Campbell, she's a, a descendant of James K. Polk. I don't really have so much a, a question as I do a comment on something that Bertram said. And his comment was the way he learned about his ancestor was to go to all of the places where his ancestor was. And we have done that. We, we went to all of the Polk places. And there's something very, very, very surreal about going to a place where your ancestor was. So even if you all don't have a presidential connection, it's something you should do as well. Go to those ancestral places because just going to where my great, great, great grandfather and stepping out at the Polk birthplace and knowing my great, great, great grandfather walked that land and my great, 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 great grandmother is buried there. It connected me to the past. And it's something very, very emotional. And it's something everyone should do, even if you don't have a famous ancestor of some sort. So that's my comment for everybody, Great. not just a question for y'all, although, hi. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Appreciate that. I think we're going to have to uh, to to wrap it up. Uh, we could take one more question from the audience, and then. Right up. Uh, question for Tweed Roosevelt. 
If your great grandfather were alive today and involved in politics, what party do you think he would be involved <laughs> with, or none of the above? Well, I don't like to answer questions about what he would do, because you know the world is so different uh, now. Parties bear no relationship, or very little relationship, to what they did in 1900. Uh, and even then, you know, when he was a Republican, but he he wouldn't have been he wouldn't have been accepted by most as a mainline Republican at all. Uh, so I don't know what he would do now, uh, and. Uh, you know, there's no way to know that. And furthermore, he can affect us these days, but it's us that matter and what we think uh, and what we think and thinking. And so uh, that's one of the reasons the Society of Presidential Descendants wants to try. It's egregious how ignorant much of our country, and particularly the younger parts, but much of our country is as to what this country is all about, the difference between a republic and a democracy. Uh, and what, even more importantly, as people like de Tocqueville would say, uh, what are our responsibilities as a citizens, not just to vote, but to understand what's going on and to, to, and to follow it. So we, uh, the Society of Presidential Descendants, also I'm connected to Long Island University where I'm starting a school of public policy. And the idea is to, we've got to get back to teaching our kids how the system works and what they need to do as good citizens, because a democracy does not work unless we have an educated and sort of a good citizen, moral as they used to call it in the old days, uh, citizenry. And so we should all be trying to help our kids understand how it works. Thank you. Uh, I, I, just wanna, I just wanna thank all of you for being here and supporting history. I wanna thank Nicholas for such a wonderful Cherry Blossom Festival that we're all just, we're so. We were all just so living on the edge, hoping that we would be able to be here this year. And uh, as I mentioned early on, we're all such great friends and, and, and it's like homecoming days. I think Lewis said that too, and it's like homecoming day when you come here. And uh, it's, it's just so great to be here. And thank you again, my friend, for, for putting this together. Uh, I do want to say I've spent my life studying your families and I know the sacrifices that your families had done to serve our country and I see those sacrifices continuing on in all of you and what you're doing for history and it's an honor to share the stage with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, let's give them another huge round of applause. That was a great job. And we'll do our traditional photo op. I'd like to ask Jill Campbell, is Gayla Gibbs still here? Jack Scaife and Donnie, Katie, Tom, if you'd like to be in the picture as well. Am I missing any of the presidential descendants if they'd like to come forward for the traditional presidential family picture? And hey, but before we leave and you get too excited, it's Cherry Boss Blossom tradition to have our final Assume words. Attention, Walmart the shoppers. Man returned from Washington with a dream from to Olivia share de Havilland herself of cherry trees residing beneath the cherry blossom tree. Everywhere. A place to entertain those echoes from the past. A time to gather history and traditions that would last. The people came together in this little country town, a busy little village where love and faith abound. They planted trees along with dreams of what someday would be harvesting a bounty they could not see. You might recognize the name, but maybe not the face, in remembrance of all who made this world a much better place.
from authors to astronomers, munchkins to musicians, we gather here together so we can learn and listen. From Lassie's pal to Barney's gal and presidential kin, they all share their stories as we remember when. Come along and take a stroll along life's memory lane and reminisce of names engraved of the Missouri Walk of Fame. Like returning robins on an April breeze, we will meet in springtime beneath the cherry blossom trees. Dame Olivia de Havilland.